Summer blockbuster season is upon us with films like Transformers 4 and 22 Jump Street opening up every weekend. But if you're looking for something a little bit cooler, check out the documentary The United States vs. Whitey Bulger, one of my favorite films at the Sundance Film Fest. It tells the incredibly true story of the real-life Boston gangster Whitey Bulger, who played the FBI like a fiddle, pretending he was an informant, while using their intel to get out of Boston before they came down on him. Where'd he go? Well, it turned out he was my neighbor for 16 years in Santa Monica before getting busted as his girlfriend's hairdresser turned him in. Hmm. So for all you gangsters in hiding, keep your ladies away from the beauty parlor. It's my pleasure to welcome Michael Levine to Q-Score. Michael's an eight-time ASCAP Film and Television Music Award winner for scoring the Jerry Bruckheimer-produced Cold Case. As well as being a respected composer of concert music, he also wrote the music for the iconic Kit Kat, Give Me a Break Jingle, classic. And he arranged the choir for the Simpsons movie, Spider Pig Track. Not only that, produced Lord's spooky rendition of Everybody Wants to Rule the World from the Hunger Games Catching Fire soundtrack. Not only that, he's a board member of the TV Academy. So let's welcome Michael Levine. How are you, my friend? Hello. How you doing? Good, buddy. So uh, I recently ran into you at the event you did, and the Guild uh, co-sponsored your uh, event, which we share the same title of, SCORE. That's true. Uh, which was a fantastic event, 68-piece orchestra. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and 34 voices, and then actually 40 voices, including the soloists. Yeah. And so tell us about the germination of the event, how it came together, and how you picked the amazing composers that you had. I mean, you had people doing... Um, the Borgias, uh, you had people doing Family Guy, which was very diverse. Talk about how you picked, you guys picked the music for that event. Well, we primarily went at, um, wanted to feature contemporary music that had been, uh, had recently been either been nominated or won an Emmy. Um, so we included House of Cards, Game of Thrones, Downton Abbey, many other shows, um, and uh, the composers of the shows actually came out and conducted their segments in most circumstances. Uh, they also, we also had a couple of interesting, fun little bits, such as uh, uh, Bear McCreary, who conducted the, the Walking Dead. And during his Walking Dead segment, uh, we had zombies come out of the audience and carry him away. Uh, it was screaming. fantastic. And, uh, and one of his assistants was dressed as a zombie and continued conducting the orchestra. Yeah. It was... Uh, uh, that was that was the moment that seemed to make all the trade papers. Uh, yeah, it was a, it's an amazing moment because you're in this class, beautiful classical hall, and all of a sudden zombies start coming down the aisles, and you know take the composer away and rip them up. It was fantastic. And then you also did with Game of Thrones, you had a sword fight and break out and uh, kill the composer, I believe. So uh, talk about that one. How did that one come up? Well, <laughs> we didn't actually kill the composer. Ramin got to survive that. Uh, Ramin Javadi, who does uh, the uh, uh, who scores Game of Thrones. It was actually, the idea was it was a bridge between Borgias and Tudors, which are scored by uh, Trevor Morris, and into, because that was the sort of, the sort of real Middle Ages to the completely fantasy Middle Ages of um, Game of Thrones, and so we had a sword fight. Uh, the idea really evolved from something that uh, my fellow governor, uh, Tony Carey, uh, suggested, and he said, you know, you really should involve as many of the other branches of the academy besides music as you can. And so, uh, first thing I thought of was, well, who's more ignored than music? Stunts. <laughs> That's a <laughs> great so idea. I talked with Dorenda Moore, who's uh, one of the stunt governors, and she was awesome. She put together the whole thing. That's fantastic because it was very unexpected, and that's what's great about those kind of events. So, is this something you'd like to do every year? This type of event, or is this a, it was an inaugural event, right? It was an inaugural event. I would like it to be annual. Uh, we're discussing it with the academy. We'll see. Um, I think it will be a regular event. Whether it will actually be annual or not is a little preliminary to say. I think there's going to be some kind of annual event. This is. We're just beginning to discuss this. So, right. uh, you know, really everything is up for grabs at this point. Right. And for us as a Music Supervisor Guild, it was nice to be able to help sponsor it and hopefully someday we'll work on being part of the 
you know, for well, the TV. absolutely, and and in fact, you brought up an interesting thing, which is that the music supervisors who contribute so much to the shows on the air and contribute so much to the 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 storytelling of uh, television drama uh, are currently only represented. Only a small number of them are represented in the Television Academy. Um, and uh, be those who also who were television executives, but the most of the rank and file of uh, music supervisors are sadly uh, left out of the process, and that's something that that I've actually been championing uh, the trying to find a way. Um, and you know, like any large organization, the Television Academy changes slowly. But we've got some pretty visionary leadership right now, and in both in Bruce Rosenblum, who's our CEO, and uh, Maury McIntyre, who's our president, our new president. And uh, I, I, I am optimistic that this is going to be changing. Um, exactly what form it will take, I'm not sure yet. But I can say, from my experience, for example, when I scored Cold Case, we had first. Um, uh, Jason Alexander and Rudy Chung from Hit the Ground Running, and then we had Frankie Pine and uh, Wendy Crowley from uh, Whirly Girl, and, and uh, finally Janae DeAngelis uh, mm -hmm. was our, our last uh, music supervisor. And each one of them contributed something of great importance uh, to the show. And uh, I felt like, as the composer of the show, I worked in tandem a great deal with them and, and was very grateful for their contributions and it really did open my thinking up as to what the importance of music supervisors yeah, I mean, such the, as yourself. Yeah, you know, supervision is one of those great things. It's a neb it has its nebulousness. Sometimes you're picking a lot of the music, sometimes you're just helping to clear the music. So I think that's obviously the stigma of, you know, making sure that they get, you know, the attention they need. I know the Academy of, you know, Motion Pictures has recognize certain supervisors and let them join as voting members. So it would only make sense that the TV Academy would follow suit. Let's get back to Cold Case for a second. So that show ran for how many years? Uh, seven seasons. Seven seasons. And tell us about scoring a, become a procedural drama, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's funny. It was referred to as a procedural drama because it was uh, a Jerry Bruckheimer show and he does many procedural dramas. It was a crime drama. The procedural part was kind of the MacGuffin. What it was really about was about the fact that any time somebody is murdered, it's a tragedy. And the structure of the show was such that you would have these flashbacks that would go back not just to the time of when the crime occurred, which is, yes, it did, but it was really to tell you how this person was important to the world. And this was Meredith Steam's concept. She was the original showrunner and um, I think it was a unique show in that regard in that it didn't, it wasn't so much about the crime, it was about the victim's life. And so uh, uh, Jonathan Littman from uh, Bruckheimer said, uh, you get to write an opera every week. And, and he was right. That was, uh, so what was your main instrumentation on the show? What did you focus on or what was your lead instruments? How did you figure out what your palette was every week? Well, it really depended on what the story needed um, because I would oftentimes make a reference to what the time period was and sometimes um, that meant uh, if it was a 50s show there would be uh, an electric guitar with tremolo. Uh, if it was something more, uh, we did a show from 1929 and I had upright piano and uh, we, had, uh, it, 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 we had something that involved um, a, a, a Russian immigre, and, and that was solo violin and um, uh, and and balalaika, and so it, and then of course lots of electronic uh, music as well. It, right. But these were the featured instruments. I think my, when I first saw it, my friend played Jackie Robinson, if I'm not mistaken, on a show or some it was on a show some period like 50s type type event, um, and then that had a good run. Um, before that, you did, you worked in Nickelodeon, right? You did The Naked Brothers, is that true? Well, actually, that was uh, concurrent with it. Uh, yeah, I was, I produced records uh, with Nat and Alex Wolf. Nat is uh, actually appearing in The Fault in Our Stars. Oh, The, oh, the Fault in Our Stars is going to be the big uh, youth-oriented film of the summer. It's, it, 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 it's a beautiful story about these two young people who fall in love when they're uh, uh, both diagnosed with cancer. Mm. Nat is actually has the second lead in it, uh, but he's been tapped to be the lead in 
uh, a movie called uh, Paper Towns and another one which is uh, The Stand based on uh, uh, the Stephen King novel. And Nat, who is, he and his brother Alex, who are still fine musicians, I mean, Naked Brothers, for those who never saw it, was uh, sort of the monkeys with a kid's band. And they were literally kids. They started out uh, ages 13 and 9 when the show started. Uh, Nat's now 19. Um, and uh, uh, but they're still fine musicians, and in fact, they both sang on a song that I wrote with uh, Arthur Hamilton, who most famously wrote Cry Me a River a long time ago. And uh, we wrote this for a movie called Fugly, which is a John Leguizamo film that'll be out later this summer. And Nat and Alex did just an awesome job singing it. Now, it did great. you score Fugly also, or just songs? I scored it as well, and, and wrote a couple of songs for it, but one with Arthur, which is the love theme. and. Uh, um, it's called Lara Lara Lara, which is based on the name of the central character. Uh, not to be confused with something Marie Char wrote a long time ago. So you're kind of a double threat in the sense that you can not only score, but you actually are write, you'll write and collaborate with other people's songs. And so how, how, how often does that happen where you get to do both on a film or, or a TV show? Well, as much as I can possibly make it happen. Uh, I started out as a songwriter, and uh, it's funny because I'm a violinist. A lot of people think, oh, well, you know, you were Stone Cold classicist. I really, I was always a dabbler in the classical world. And uh, though I've written chamber music and, and a couple of orchestral pieces that have been per performed, there's a... Uh, piece for uh, musical saw and strings that has been performed in a number of places, th places throughout the country. And uh, I wrote a musical saw. Musical saw, yes, and and, and also uh, pedal steel. And uh, I wrote a concerto for pedal steel and orchestra that was premiered in Nashville. But but honestly, that my initial impulse as a kid was I was a songwriter. And um, I one of the things that I loved about the classic Henry Mancini scores is he would write songs usually with somebody a great lyricist like Johnny Mercer, and then it would be incorporated into the score of the, the, of the movie. And it's something I've done a number of times. I would like to do more. Sometimes it's a hard sell. It's one of my favorite things, one of my favorite stories is when I did Don Juan DeMarco. I put out the record and, you know, Michael Kamen, they had a formula, you know, Kamen would score, uh, Mutt Lang would produce a song that Brian Adams would sing. And they did it so well in Don Juan DeMarco, where they weaved the theme in the end. and. Uh, it's, you're right, it's something that it's like a kind of almost like a lost art form, and it's beautiful when it's done correctly, like that. Well, Kamen was definitely a guy who had a foot in both worlds. He went to Juilliard, he was an oboe player primarily, right. and then uh, had the New York Rock and Roll Ensemble with Mark Snow, who was right, just... Right, which was great, which who, I learned who, about from your event score, which was great backstory for me for Kamen. And, and Mark Snow, we just uh, honored at our event with a, a yeah. Career Achievement Award. Um, he, Mark, for those who don't know, scored, going back to Starsky and Hutch, does Blue Bloods today, but did The X-Files most famously. But he and Mark and, Mar and uh, Michael Kamen were in a band called the New York Rock and Roll Ensemble. And, you know, they were big for a minute back in the 70s. And so Michael Kamen definitely could, had absolutely stone cold, bona fides in the classical world, but he was a rock and roller, too. Yeah. So another thing, give us the dirt on what's going on with the Star Wars thing, because obviously, you know, J.J. Abrams is getting ready to direct this movie. There's a lot of hype, but yet you had done a full episode, many full episodes of an animated series, correct? That's right. It was called Star Wars Detours, and it was a parody of Star Wars that uh, George Lucas produced, and Seth Green and his partner Matt Seinreich also uh, were producers on it. Uh, it came about because both uh, Seth MacFarlane, who does one of the voices in the show, and Seth Green had done parodies of Star Wars. And um, the story, I wasn't there, but the story, as I've been told, is that uh, Lucas called them into his office and said, so you guys think you're funny, huh? Well, why don't you be funny for me? And that's how the show came about. And we did 39 episodes. They are wow. very funny. How long are the episodes? Is it 22 well, they're, minutes? Well, they're, they're, they're half hour episodes, yeah. yeah. But um, it's animated, it's funny, it's, some of it is pretty, pretty specific uh, references. Um, uh, and uh, all directed by a guy named Todd Grimes, who uh, was the showrunner and, and was Is it brilliant. a PG type of show, or is it a racy? It, it has its moments. It's not as edgy as Family Guy, uh, or, um, but it's, you know, it has its moments. It's, it's a little bit all over the map in that regard. Um, 
but uh, it, it uh, what at the as we approached the point where it needed to go in the air, um, it, Lucasfilms changed hands, and uh, Disney now owns it. And the decision was that they didn't want to have something that made fun of Star Wars out before Episode Seven came out. Right. So it's been delayed. It probably won't air for another year or year and a half, something right. like that. So you have a you need some you need some time on that one. But it was yeah. nice that Lucas can poke a little fun at himself. Uh, it was. He's a funny guy. I mean, he's you know. I, I didn't, I, it's not like we're best buddies, but I did get to know him a little bit. And um, he's a very quiet, um, uh, unprepossessing personality. And, you know, if, if he weren't George Lucas, if you walked into a room and there were 50 people there, uh, he would not be the guy you'd say, oh, that must be the most powerful fellow. He's not like one of those right. uh, it, it, extroverted, uh, out there p p people. He sort of, you know. So you got watches. to interact with him a little bit. A, a, a little bit. I, I, you know, he, yeah, I got to, you know, he approved of everything we, I did, and we did get to. Mostly, I dealt with Todd Grimes though, who was uh, great, and, um, you know, it, I, I also know Matt Groening a bit from working on the Simpsons right, movies. Right. So let's talk about and, that. And 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 he's actually sort of a similar personality. You know, extremely bright, extremely insightful, but. Kind of more on the introverted side. Right. So Simpsons, you know, my son's all-time favorite shows, and you know, I, I guess at your event, it was said it was the longest running. What was the? Uh, it was the longest running animated show of all time. Or I, I, I that may I be true. Is, yeah. I, I don't recall exactly what the, but it's certainly been on the air a long time. It's and 25, so you, years. one of your most memorable things was the movie that pig was a pig. Uh, Spider Pig. Yeah. Spider well, pig, right? uh, I, I was working for Hans Zimmer, who uh, scored the the film. Uh, now Alf Clausen does, has done scored the show since the second season and so the television show which is a different thing but uh it, the film was uh scored by uh, hans and there were a few things where he the way that hans works is he has sort of a team of people who basically do the stuff he doesn't feel like doing he does all the big themes and all the important moments but uh this was something that uh, was sort of a throwaway i mean it literally came about because we had a vocal session coming up and we had time, we had more time booked than we had time stuff to record. And he said, why don't you do something on that spider pig thing? Because there was, it was a sort of a one-off joke at that point. And I said, well, what should it sound like? And he says, I don't know, beautiful and short. Mm -hmm. And that was the entire direction. So That's then great. I did this choir arrangement of spider pig and it became a, a ringtone in England and this and that. It became sort of, they used it twice in the film, so. That's great. So I, you also play a little harmonica, so why don't you oh. let us close with a piece of some well, other that you might have played from. You know, I don't, I don't I, it's, it's usually used as just a color thing, but I, I did play the harmonica on a Simpsons commercial for Coca-Cola uh, that um, uh, Jim Brooks oversaw and um, David Silverman directed. But uh, I'll just play you a little bit of blues. <laughs> yeah, nice work. Well, thank you. So Michael you Levine, everybody. He's not only a governor of the TV Academy, he can score, he can write songs, and yes, he can play the harmonica. Thanks so much for coming in. I really All appreciate right, my it. Pleasure. For more Q Score, please check us out at EmpowerMe.tv to find out what goes on behind the curtain and how the film and TV music gets made. It happens right here. Tune in.